Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to our Learning from Leader series. We're delighted today to have Johnny Harris, a filmmaker, YouTuber, influencer, and a fa the founder of A Bright Trip. As always, I'm joined here today by Peter Van Am, the, uh, the author of Before I Was a CEO. Peter, good to see you again. It has good been a long time, you. nearly one month. I know it's it has, and uh, luckily for us, uh, at least spring has started. And uh, as you know, because we're both in Geneva, uh, happily also will we'll, we seem to be going to some reopening, some terraces. So uh, good news is on the way. It seems uh, good to see you, Luke, and of course uh, a big welcome to our uh, guest today, Johnny Harris. I'm a big fan of of Johnny, uh, who has been an influential documentary filmmaker for a couple of years now. First starting at Vox in the US, creating an incredible series called Borders, and now as an independent filmmaker, I had a chance actually to sponsor uh, one of uh, Johnny's works with the World Economic Forum. And also Johnny is a entrepreneur, startup entrepreneur with his company Bright Trip. So we've got a lot to get through, uh, Johnny, in this hour that you're with us. Thank you so much. But first, uh, we have to know, of course, how you are, and we typically start by asking you, how are you, but also where are you? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm, I'm good. Uh, I'm feeling the same optimism you are. Um, I'm in Washington, D.C., and I am fully vaccinated uh, as of a few days ago, which wow. I can't tell you the, the mental shift that that has had uh, in just everything. Um, so um, feeling very optimistic. It, the, the weather is sort of adding to that. Uh, I'm travel is on the horizon and um, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling really good. I just, uh, just about literally seven minutes ago passed uh, 1 million subscribers on YouTube. I just saw the oh, clicker wow. to click up uh, and, and that was sort of an exciting thing. So yeah, some, some good optimism all around today. Yeah, it's, it's, it's indeed a special moment to, to be talking, of course. Uh, you, you guys are a little bit further ahead, I think, in the U.S. in terms of vaccinations than, than many other places, including uh, Europe. But, you know, we do, we do have to look back a little bit, don't we, to how COVID nevertheless has impacted your life and also your work. Because, I mean, your work has been a lot about travel. Um, and obviously that couldn't happen for the last year and a half. Yeah, yeah. I'm. I mean, the U.S. is a, is ahead now, but if you remember the past year, we were pretty dismal with our response uh, the whole way through, and it led to this fits and spurts of of hope, and then uh, horror, and and it, and it has been a roller coaster, I, I think, for everyone in the world. But um, seeing you know a lack of leadership in our country uh, during the crisis has been its own sort of psychological uh, difficulty, and with as it pertains to my work. Certainly, that uh, was deeply affected. My my wife and I both um, are international travel filmmakers. Um, that's what we do. We're on the road uh, with our kids, and that's just that is that was our lifestyle. And so, last April, really March and April, we really had to start to think differently about how we're going to keep doing our craft, telling stories, sharing. Uh, and, and explaining things about the world without being able to go and look at those things in the world. And so my work turned really towards an exercise of learning how to refine my journalistic voice from the office and, and how can I still tell stories and get creative um, uh, without the, the tool of going and actually interacting with the places I'm telling stories about. And so the, the nature of the stories changed um, in terms of much more macro, much more analytical. But at the same time, I, I was able to make a lot more work because I wasn't traveling and I wasn't dealing with the sort of the complexities of that. And, and so while that was difficult and there was a lot of sort of friction in that transition, there was a lot of learning from just repetitions of getting creative and having, having new constraints to, to shift around in. And, and honestly, strangely enough, you know, the, the channel, which was sort of a, a big risk for me to jump out independently, grew uh, in a huge way in this past year, more than more than ever. And, and so sort of a weird silver lining in all of this. Um, but yeah, it was it was a big shift. It was a big pivot. Yeah. And I guess there's a lot of uh, hope in, the, in that message that you're bringing, because I mean, if somebody whose life literally revolved around traveling, uh, was able and life and work with uh, revolved out traveling was able to reinvent uh, himself uh, during 
this crisis, then it gives a lot of hope, I think, to many other people. Um, now let's turn to the, to the future because obviously things do look like they're gonna go back to some sort of normal, at least for a little while. Uh, so does that mean that now you've grown so popular even in, in, in lockdown that you'll stay in the office or are you planning to go back to traveling? I'm, I'm absolutely planning to go back to on the ground reporting. That's, that's my natural habitat. And, and the biggest trade-off in this past year has been I've been telling these stories of, of how, you know, Hawaii became a Hawaii and how it was colonized by the U.S. or how the U.S. Uh, took over the Western United States, you know, sort of doing this series on the expansion of the United States and a lot of other different stories. And every one of those stories, while it has an analytical narrative that is maybe satisfying and useful, it's so single dimensional because I haven't been able to go do the thing that humanizes those stories and brings them to life to, to viewers. And so it's the, the service to viewers is highly intellectual, but loses out on that other piece that I feel is so important for these types of stories, which is the human, the authentic version of that macro story. And so as soon as it's possible, uh, that is absolutely my intention to start continuing to tell these stories from the office from time to time, but making sure that I also am working on these bigger, more ambitious stories that, that tell human versions, which I, I think are at the end of the day, the reason we talk about policy, the reason we talk about history is that it affects people today and, and that's, in my mind, the, the real value. And that's why I say it's my, it's my natural habitat. That's where I want to be. I also just love it. That's where I feel like I'm most alive is when I'm out there reporting, talking to people with my camera and really getting that raw version of the story that's very easy to turn into a, a theory or an idea or a force or a sort of macro data point uh, when really it's, it's a bunch of people. Yeah, and in fact, I look forward to you traveling again because, you know, uh, I moved to Switzerland with my wife and uh, I know that Switzerland is one of your favorite countries. And, and so we're looking forward to seeing more videos about our favorite country where oh, we now live. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, it is interesting to go uh, back perhaps a little bit in, in, in time. You know, most of the people that are with us today um, are in college or are studying their bachelor or their master's. And I'm wondering for you, it's now been a, a little while, uh, was this what you wanted to be when you were in college to be a YouTube uh, filmmaker? No, not at all. I, it's, it's funny to even entertain that idea. When I was in college, I didn't even know that YouTubers, when I thought of YouTubers, I sort of thought of like prank channels or like humor channels. I, I didn't think that there was any sort of rigorous journalistic place on on social media and and frankly you know at that time when i was in school 2010 to sort of 2013 around that time it, there really wasn't a lot of that there were sort of some kernels of that sort of work but it was very esoteric and niche um and so i had no idea and in fact i didn't have any intention of being a filmmaker at all um i i i thought i was going to be a diplomat i thought i was going to be a foreign service officer and Did when you I looked, studied for, for that, of course. Yeah, yeah. I studied international relations um, and with a focus on this idea of public diplomacy, which was is sort of a track in the American Foreign Service that deals with media. And I look back on that now and I realize that that was me trying to take my disposition of creativity and communication and funnel it into the sort of governmental tracks that existed. I luckily didn't get in. I, I, I made it to the last tier of the foreign service test and didn't make it past that, that last, uh, the oral exams. And which is the best thing that ever happened to me because I really had to rethink like, well, what am I doing here? And, um, and when I got out here to Washington DC, I realized that there was this, there was a lot of people who were really smart, who were in the think tanks doing a lot of that research, but there wasn't people doing the communication of that research. There wasn't people taking that research from the ivory tower and actually blasting it out. A lot of think tanks were trying to do that, but there wasn't someone who was deeply in touch with the learner, with the, with the lay person who wants to understand. And so I really started to say like, could I blend my love for international relations with my love for communication and visuals and maps and travel? And, and I slowly started to develop that at a think tank actually at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, uh, CSIS here in Washington, DC. Uh, that's where I really learned about that nexus of communication and international affairs and rigorous data and started to develop that. And by the end of a, about two years of that think tank, 
was like, this is it. Like, this is my niche. No more foreign service. I'm going to find a way to make this work. And luckily at that time, around 2014, 2015, Vox was born and they were sort of the perfect stepping stone to make manifest that desire to take rigorous information and communicate it in, in sort of a mass internet-y type way. So it was, it was absolutely a, a, a benefit of timing uh, with how the industry was, was maturing at the time I was, I was uh, graduating. Yeah, and of course, one of the other main components of, of much of what you, you do is you go to places, I mean, other places than Washington or, or, or your home state, you actually travel the world uh, to make uh, these uh, documentaries. Is that something, I mean, have you been traveling since you were a kid? Uh, you know, I, I, what's, what's the back, background there? Yeah, no, I grew up in a, in a small little town in Southern Oregon, five hours from any airport. Uh, and didn't leave the country until I was 18. Um, and that was to Mexico. And then I, and then I took one, my next trip was to, uh, to like Wales, you know, like I, I never, I, it was not a traveler. Uh, I, but once I did take those trips, something sort of ignited in me as like a late teenager, I said, wow, this, there, there's this sleeping dragon inside of me. That's just been, you know, growing up in this small town, never leaving even the Western United States, uh, I was like, there is something here. And, and um, so I started to effectively say, what do I need to do to mold my life around travel? And, and that's why, that's honestly why I chose international relations. I was looking at the, the list of majors and I just saw international relations and I was this, you know, 19 year old kid. And I was like, that says international. So I should choose that. I didn't have a broad intention or architecture of what the career was going to be. I was just following this impulse of, I want to communicate ideas. I, I wasn't a great student. I wasn't a fantastic learner in the traditional sense, but I loved ideas it, once I could understand them. And I wanted to create that same buzz of understanding in the lives of other people. And I also loved film and, 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 and soon graphics and motion graphics and started to learn that on my own. And it sort of intuitively followed those cues. It wasn't until uh, about six months into Vox where I wasn't, you know, we weren't, I wasn't hired to travel or anything. I was hired to animate international stories. But I, I said to my boss, I said, like, why don't we go to the place? Like we're, we're doing the, these stories about Cuba, about this and that. Why don't we go? And, and my boss was like, because we're a startup, we don't have money to send a crew to go right. make a documentary. And I said, well, what if I just went by myself and did it all. And, and I did, I did the whole production for $2,000, like under $2,000. And he was like, good luck. Like, he's like, if you can do that, we'll do it again. Like we can make a thing out of it, but like, there's no, you know, there's no way that's going to happen, but he, you know, he trusted. And, and I'm really grateful for that because my first trip was to Cuba. I wasn't equipped. I wasn't a journalist, but I had this deep desire to figure out the format. And that was the moment that I really tried to create at least some kernel of that, that format of being on the ground and talking about macro and, uh, and it worked. And, and that sort of was the kickstart to, to more and more on the ground stuff. Yeah, so I mean, no, did not grow up with that at all. It worked in an amazing way, uh, you know, and, and, and you developed actually one of the most successful series uh, of Vox, even Emmy nominated a few years ago, um, so, I mean, you're really sort of reaching for the stars. You've, you've almost invented a whole new uh, category, if you will, of reporting and, and video. Why, why would you ever then leave? Yeah, so I felt that there was, there's this other part of my disposition that is not just I want to communicate ideas about complex topics, but there's also this sort of laissez-faire obsessed with just going with the flow creative mindset, the, the one that would have made me miserable in the foreign service. And, and Vox, as Vox grew, Vox in the early days was a place where, where it was that. It was, again, I, I just pitched my boss, can I go to Cuba? And literally he was like, yeah, just, just don't spend more than $2,000. And I literally went right. to a bank in, in Miami and pulled out $2,000 of cash because Americans can't use any sort of credit debit cards. or credit card in Cuba. So I had $2,000 of cash. And I was like, I need to somehow make this stretch for 10 days in Cuba and pay, you know, like, like fixers and whatever, and like make this work. And, uh, and, and that, that was my dreamland. It was, it was wild West. No one was checking in with me. They just said, come back and make something that gets a lot of views. 
And so as Vox matured and grew, I started to feel that itch again, where I was like, oh, I'm in a system again. I'm in a system. And now there's, and again, nothing to, nothing wrong with Vox. It, it was me. It was me saying like, I need to disrupt this again and, and create another environment of big risk and, and like big ideas that I can stretch out and do weird things in and like different things. And that's, that's ultimately what led me to, uh, to decide to, uh, to step out of my own. And so I initially stepped out of my own in sort of a half and half where I was still doing borders with Vox. Uh, but I was, a, I was a freelancer. I wasn't a full-time employee. And then after uh, the, the Borders USA season was canceled because of all the, the news and all of the changes in the United States uh, last year, I then decided, okay, this is it. This is a sign for me to truly say I'm ready to lean in. And, and like I said, it wasn't the wisest decision. I maybe had a couple hundred thousand subscribers, but the, the, the economics didn't totally add up at that point for me to, to sustain that. But I delved in and again, made it work because that was the only choice. And that's what the past year has been, me trying to, to make it work the best possible. Uh, and it ended up being the right decision. And, I, and again, I, I love being in this wild west environment where there aren't rules. There's just what can you make that works in the market? Yeah. And you've, of course, uh, thought about that. Now, one of the other things that you've done, uh, besides becoming very successful as as uh, in, in independent as a filmmaker, is you've started uh, your own startup company. It's called Bright Trip. And, and it really seems in a, in a certain way, an extension, of course, of uh, what you've done and what you've learned as you've traveled um, uh, in the past few years. But it's also uh, much more than that. Could you tell us a little bit about what that is and, and where that idea came from? Yeah. So as I started to develop this love for communicating complex ideas in a visual way, using video and a, a unique sort of voice in video that was accessible and 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 really digestible, I thought, you know, I I I don't want to just have this be associated with me and my face, you know, like that's a very limiting version of that thing. That ethos of communication could be a lot bigger and could be applied to so many other things that have nothing to do with me. And so, and again, my, my wife is, was also in the same boat of realizing what's the bigger version of what we're doing. And it was at that time that we met uh, Andrew, our co-founder who has a background in education technology. He builds platforms for education. Um, and we came together and built this idea of Bright Trip, which is a place where you can take a travel course. If you're going to Wales or if you're going to Morocco, instead of reading a book about it or reading a bunch of blog posts, you can buy a course that uses all of these same techniques of, of video and communication and rigor and, and history to demystify a place and to enlighten you about that place, the story of that place, how to actually take it on in a culturally sensitive way, in a responsible way, in a way that really gets you close to the to the place and the people. And and it has nothing to do with me. I, I, I made, obviously I've informed the systems and the background and the voice and all of that. And then we made the first few courses, but we're now scaling. And it's amazing to see the Bright Trip ethos has been bottled and now it's working and now it's being executed by other people that I may be giving oversight over. But the goal is that it starts to roll upon itself and it becomes a product that people want to consume in the same way that they want to consume my YouTube videos because it makes them learn about it, about something that they want to learn about. In this case, it's uh, for travel preparation. So we launched that uh, in January of 2020, uh, moments perfect before timing. travel. Yeah, perfect timing for <laughs> to launch a travel startup. Um, and on, but honestly, yes, because during that time, a lot of the incumbents in the travel world really took a big hit. And, you know, it's not a happy thing, but if you're trying to start a new disruptive company, that's also like, all right, this is an opportunity for us to, when travel comes back, be the new version of travel, the more informed, the more uh, sensitive, authentic version of travel, which we think is the direction travel is going. Oh, and it's visual and video which is also the new way of consuming information. And so we are now really gearing up for a pretty aggressive scaling process to grow this company into um, hopefully a, a, a giant company. And next time you go on a trip, you'll go to Bright Trip and you'll, you'll buy a course to prepare for your trip. Yeah, absolutely. And it seems like you've already been able to attract some some partners as well, I suppose also investors, but one brand name that, that we see appear on the website is that of Lonely Planet, which is of course, one of those established names 
in the in the sector. You know, did you know going into it, and and when did you start to figure out, you know, what was going to be that business model, how you were going to make money, and how you were going to be attractive to other investors or partners? It is a huge learning experience. Every single week, us co-founders, the three of us, sit around and we digest whatever happened this week with sales and with investor, because we're talking to VCs all the time too. We're talking to other just just we're talking to all sorts of people and getting so much information. And then we sit down and we say like, okay, pivot a little bit this way. And then we sort of marinate on that for three weeks. And then it's like, well, no, a little bit this. So no, absolutely. There's no, uh, like, it, it's almost like with my career, I'm not, I don't have some grand arc of exactly how it's going to go. What we have is an ambition of this vision of smarter travel with video. That's the thing. That's the core. That's not changing how it plays out, what the model is, how we're monetizing, how we're marketing it, who's our partner, how the partnerships work, investors, all of that is a minute by minute. We are making those decisions, having some successes, a lot of dead ends and fail quick and move on. Uh, and we're learning a lot. I feel like I'm in a, I'm in like a boot camp for startups <laughs> because I'm learning so much about just the realities of, of this very merciless thing called business where where if consumers don't find your product or they don't want to buy your product for a certain reason it's it's on you you have to figure out that puzzle and that's a puzzle we're we're solving every day and we've we've now had some validation we're having some real revenue and some real traction that we feel is attractive enough to then go to a vc and say hey we have a formula here let's let's pour some fuel on the fire and see where this can go yeah and uh, as of course as you're trying to figure out your your way in in your career uh, your way with your your startup, uh, you're at the same time also balancing, you know, your family life because you mentioned a few times your your wife is. You also have two two little kids. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's a lot to to try and and, and balance. How do you? I mean, obviously uh, that that you know it's it's very hard to do that and and to to share uh, what the best practices are because they differ per person and over time. But what what are some of the things that you've learned along the way on that front? The only way it all works is is boundaries. Um, and this is, this is what I've learned and is, has taught me because I'm sort of like, I'm a head down kind of guy. I want to sit and just pound away at, like I'm an operator. I, I'm not even a big picture thinker. A lot of the times I just want to make the thing and make it as good as possible and push it out. Um, and what we've learned in recent years is we've taken on more of these, so many of these different things and tried to raise a family uh, and have very strong family values around being present with them it has turned into the city of strong boundaries. Uh, we are off every single day at 4.30 and there's no, there's, there's no, uh, like our nanny is off at 4.30 and neither of us work late. Like that is a rule in our home. And so when I arrive in, in the office in the morning, that 4.30 finish line is there. It is there, it's on my mind. And the entire day is blocked out to accommodate all of the different things in this highly disciplined way, such that at 4.30 I'm off. And there's some... There's some almost uh, relief to that, to know that there's a firm boundary because there's this weird law of nature that we've learned that when you put a strong ceiling on something, your survival instinct will find a way to arrange all this stuff. Sometimes it doesn't add up. A week like this week where my nanny is uh, in Guatemala and we're, we're juggling, it's chaotic, stuff isn't getting done and we're just trying to figure it out. But usually when we've dialed everything in, uh, I can get off at 4.30 every day and somehow get it all done. And then I, I've also learned the power of delegating things that are not the best use of my time. And that's something I've learned just in the past year and a half. Uh, an operations manager now who is my email, I don't look at my email anymore, uh, which is an amazing thing because I'm, I'm hyper dyslexic. Uh, and when I look at an email thread, I just, it's just a jumble of, and I take probably three times longer to digest everything than I need to. And so now I have somebody who does that and, and feeds it to me in a way that works at the right time. And it's, it's all dialed in sort of like a machine. And that, what that, that sounds maybe overly disciplined or overly dramatic, but what it does is it allows me at 4.30 to be done and to come home and then have that time with my children where it's boundaried, it's, it's very protected. And maybe that won't always be the case once my kids get older and they don't want to hang out with me as much. Maybe I will flex those boundaries in some way, but that has been the only way it's, it's all worked out. 
I mean, it's it's really incredible, and 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 you know, we learn from different people. I talked to some other CEOs uh, who actually also. I went to see them in their office and they didn't have a, a laptop. They didn't have a computer. And I was like, how do you manage a company of like multi-billion dollars uh, and you don't even have a computer? And, 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 and I think some of the learnings there are the same. Now, uh, obviously you have those physical and time boundaries. You also have certain ethical boundaries and a moral compass, um, if you will. We got a question here. that's maybe a little bit of a sidebar, but maybe not from Dennis Lloyd Willer uh, from Switzerland. And he said, well, you know, I've noticed that you have a, a background, uh, you come from a Mormon background. Mm -hmm. uh, does that play at all, uh, he asks, into what you do, uh, uh, you know, how you make your stories, but perhaps in other parts of your life or of your, of your career? Yeah, so, so I grew up uh, as a member of the Mormon church uh, and chose to leave the church about five or six years ago. Um, but that, the... the the culture of the church, uh, which there's a lot of, in my mind, unhealthy and damaging culture of the church, but there's also this culture of sort of industrious discipline that that is, not, again, not always healthy and shouldn't really be glorified. But what it did is it sort of gave me a framework around working hard and and having goals and valuing family. And th those things have stuck around for me um, while I've purged some of the other things. In terms of the moral compass I wouldn't say the the Mormon church dialed that in for me. I would say that arose from parents. And then, and then of course, Iz and I uh, have developed our own version of our moral compass. My ethical journalistic compass has come and is still developing, you know, as I forge these new paths. That comes from my work at Vox and learning from really talented people about where those lines are. So it's an amalgam of a lot of things. I think the Mormon piece is one ingredient uh, of, of many that have led to, uh, some of these, these boundaries and, and these sort of moral compasses. Yeah. Um, that's very, you know, I think we're all trying to figure out, and especially of course you, since you're working in a couple of industries that are, as you say, are developing, um, and where sort of the business models are, are evolving, uh, but also sort of, as you say, the, 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 the boundaries in terms of what's a ethical practice and, and whatnot. I mean, you, you and I have been a little bit involved in that, um, as we as we collaborated, do you wh where do you get where do you get that from? Is it from looking at what exists and others are, are thinking about this? Do, do you develop that on your own? What what are some of the, your major uh, guidelines in life, let's say, or your yeah. uh, the things you look at? This is a this is a big question, and it's one that I'm in flux with as I as I grow, especially as I grow and there's more scrutiny. You know, as as you grow as a voice in whatever platform. There's now scrutiny as to who you're taking money from, um, and who you know who has your ear, and are you an objective storyteller? Where are your motives? And and I I am not. It's it's interesting. We have we have institutions that answer these questions. We have literal entire cultures and ethical frameworks that are developed over time to answer those questions and those conflicts. So to expect an individual who's in a new industry to be able to navigate that in a like in a sort of clean way is a really difficult order. And especially as I'm trying to build a business, I'm trying to grow uh, and scale and all these things, there's, there's big business mandates. At the end of the day, my North Star is that I am trying to tell fact-based, truthful stories, period. And, and if those stories are in collaboration with the World Economic Forum, who, you know, is, has done really amazing research, or, or even with Google, for example, I do work with Google sometimes, a, a big for-profit organization who's, whose job is to just make money. But they also do work that I believe in, in terms of like Google Maps and that, you know, a lot of their, so, and so I'm not ready to write off any organization just because they make money. I'm ready to write it off if the facts don't line up or if I don't agree with the interpretation of the data. But if I do agree with that and I can defend it, I will tell a story that uses that data to defend a certain fact. I, that may change a year from now. If you talk to me, I may have a whole different compass. I will maybe a little bit more seasoned in this, but I want to tell stories with facts. I want to enlighten people about how the world works, period. How that's funded, and where those lines are is is constantly in flux. But as long as that's my North Star, I, th I think I'm in pretty good shape. And I think my audience will develop a trust around that sort of earnest desire to share real stories with real facts. 
Yeah, and we see that, of course, in, in the number of fans that you have and, and the kind of people or the number of people uh, that, that also watch your videos. Uh, you know, I want to bring in a, in a couple of those people, Johnny, if that's okay with you, uh, yeah. that are, have joined us uh, today. Uh, and perhaps why don't we start with Simon, Simon, who is originally from Zimbabwe, uh, but is studying in Barcelona. And we're all very jealous with uh, where he is right now. Um, uh, <laughs> and uh, Simon, uh, you had a couple of questions, uh, I think. Uh, do you want to kick it off with a question perhaps on, on Bright Trip? Um, yeah, sure. So hello, Johnny. I'm Simon. And as Peter mentioned, I'm from Zimbabwe. And I'm studying business management and finance in EU business school in my final year now. Um, one of my uh, main questions was, um, so your experience as a, uh, as a filmmaker and YouTuber revolves around and depends on social media. Uh, recently, there has been a lot of debate about the alleged politicization of social media platforms like YouTube and Instagram. Most recently about the silence in culture uh, what are your thoughts on this? And do you think this may impact Bright Trip's business model in any way, shape or form? Uh, when you consider things like boycotting or some of the funding things that you were talking about just earlier, maybe you could just shed some light on that. Yeah, I think that there's a whole, we could have an hour long discussion about where the lines are on, on cancel culture, or silencing culture, or the idea of boycotting in a sort of massive way when somebody has a gap or a really serious, you know, like th those are case by case things that are, are really hard to, to put a blanket statement over. As it pertains to Bright Trip though, we are really aware that there's a serious outcry against the status quo and especially in travel. Yeah. And that status quo in travel is often looks very much like the same person who you think of as the person who can travel and, and I fit that archetype and I am that cliche and we're very aware of that. And what we are trying to build is a place that while it's founded on the communication ethos uh, of, of empowering people with knowledge, it will embody a, a communication technique and the people, the voices who are actually doing that communication, <clears throat> we're committed to making it as diverse and disruptive as possible because we believe that 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 silencing culture is not just uh, an outcry or a, it's, 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 an out, it's a very authentic outcry that comes from very real roots and is, is very deserving. There's very, there's a, there, are, there are things that deserve to be canceled if they are not making an effort to change and to represent the reality of our world. And so we think about this all the time as we're thinking about who's going to host our courses. Like we're thinking about Morocco right now. We have a, a Spanish YouTuber who's going to host this course in, uh, of, a, of a road trip in Morocco, but we are absolutely making sure that when we're talking about religious culture in Morocco, we are interviewing a, a Berber in Southern Morocco who can actually speak to Berber ethnicity and as it pertains to Muslim culture, because that, that person, uh, that Spanish YouTuber, isn't the person to, to have a voice for that part of that culture. I, I run into this all the time as someone who tries to tell stories in other people's countries. The, the, the moral juxtaposition of who am I to go to India and tell their story is, is a big thing that I, I believe deserves criticism. And so I don't know how that's going to play out as we grow, uh, but we're absolutely committed to, and I think it's a fantastic deterrent, honestly, that, that social media has created to say, you will be canceled if you don't put in an effort, now it can be taken too far. There are cases where it's taken too far here and there. But I love that there's a deterrent. I love that there's a price to pay if you are not taking this stuff seriously. And I think social media has contributed to that in a positive way with also, of course, a million caveats and cases where it's gone too far. So that's a lot of discursive thoughts there, but it's absolutely on our mind. And that pressure and deterrent is very present as we build a company uh, that's supposed to be disruptive. Okay. Thank you. Um, go ahead. Do you, you had a second question, I think, too. Yes, I do. Uh, my second question would be, um, so, sorry, just one second. No problem. Uh, your impact, impact for YouTube channel and expertise in travel have allowed you to expand into new markets, for example, with Bright Tree. Has your well-known link to travel and to different cultures and your personal experiences uh, influenced your business model success in any way, shape or form? 
I would say that one thing I've learned is that through, through all of this travel is that the market, while, while there is a propensity, for, and this is, a, I'm going to go into human psychology here and, and maybe overstep my expertise, but I believe that people, there is a propensity for people to want to see people who look like them and, and to relate to people who look like them, who speak their language, who, who have the same cultural. But I also believe and this is what I, I really have try, tried to emulate and explore with a series like Borders, that even more than that, there is a buzz and a an enlightening experience when a viewer can relate to somebody that doesn't look like them and that they don't need. We always say, we're all the same on the inside. We all have pains. I almost want to say, well, we're not all the same. And if you can relate to somebody without saying, oh, they are just like me and say, no, they're different. And that's awesome. That is cool. And I, their story is fascinating to me. If I can be a bridge where a viewer in Nebraska can, can see a Sikh man in Northern India and not relate yeah. to him, but embrace his story, I think that there's actually a greater buzz, a, a neurological excitement that happens in that connection. It's a harder connection to facilitate but I really believe in that. And that's what Bright Trip is founded on. It's a, it's a bet we're taking, but it's one that's informed by my previous work that people want to feel experience in diversity with other places. And they actually learn more in that as opposed to just, I relate to them because I, they have a kid and I have a kid and we can both feel that together. So anyway, that's, that's sort of a philosophical, psychological thing, but it's, but it's absolutely informed uh, how we're building Bright Trip. Yeah, and and you know it's it's interesting that you mentioned the example of somebody from from India, uh, you know, uh, being an in, in inspiration uh, to somebody from from the U.S. or the Midwest or, or another place in the U.S. Uh, because you know our, our second um, uh, guest uh, student is Vicky, Vicky who's from Ecuador, uh, who is also, uh, however, studying in in Barcelona. And Vicky, you had a question precisely about that, didn't you? About what we can learn from other places. Hi. Yes. I am really impressed at the extensive collection of videos you have released with Vox, which cover so many aspects of Asian politics and culture. In your opinion, what is the biggest lesson the West can learn from Asia? Ooh, man, I don't, I don't feel ready to answer this question because I actually am in this crisis right now. Of, I'm in this, I'm in this crisis where I think everything I've learned about and specifically I'm focusing on China, everything I have read and learned about China is probably tainted. Like I, I am, I don't think I've actually done the work to get perspective on different paradigms because I feel like I'm so deeply biased against those paradigms in, in uh, cultures that are very different than mine, especially specifically China lately, I've been feeling this big time that I'm not really ready to opine on that. I'm actually going to go on this big quest, I think later this year on like a, I'm going to dig into real literature from real people in some of these cultures that I've sort of seen on the surface. Um, but yeah, that's it. So I'm not going to answer that question because I'm not ready to, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. do, you, do you have any follow-up question, Naviki? Yes, as a student of communication who wishes to focus their career on social media management, what advice can you give me to allow me to start my career and travel? Yeah, I would say find ways to, to access complicated information. There's so much of it that really good ideas that are hidden away in uh, academic papers by brilliant academics who have created really interesting analyses and yet no one will ever see them. No one will ever experience that understanding of, of all that work that is being done. If you can find a way to take those ideas and translate them, I think, it, I think translate or interpret is the best verb here because, because if you can translate those amazing ideas in a social media vernacular or language, then you, you don't have to generate the ideas yourself. You're, you're translating them to a, a mass market and you can use visuals to do that. You can use good writing to do that. You can use info, infographics and data journalism to do that. I don't know what the craft is gonna be, 
but having a way to translate those ideas and try to make them accessible, I think is the, the under, the undervalued or the underrated uh, craft of the century. And more and more we're realizing we have too much information and not enough ability to communicate that information to mass markets. And, and that is the craft that I recommend anyone in this space to try to develop. Yeah. And thank you, thank you Vicky for that question. And, you know, Johnny, there, there's, I think also a lot of questions from, from our students, uh, you know, about, you know, the creative aspect of what you do, uh, the skills that you apply. Uh, and by the way, also as a sidebar, uh, I have to say, uh, there's one person asking uh, what uh, equipment you use, because uh, he's saying, uh, Ricardo from Spain, he's saying, well, your sound quality is so amazing. What, what, what the setup are you using? <laughs> you quickly ask that before we move on it's to all, the broader it's questions. all basic stuff. I use a, a Sony camera, A7 camera, uh, with a, a Rode mic, or if you want to get really technical, write this down. I use a K2M little mic that I put on the top with a lavalier, a wireless lavalier. But honestly, like I could do this work with an iPhone. Like the gear is so, is just a medium uh, to, to tell these stories. The hardest part is the writing and the formulation of those stories that comes with time. But yeah, Sony. Well, I I'm glad you say that because obviously I, I haven't figured out my uh, optimal sound uh, setup yet. Anyway, uh, <laughs> want to maybe go to uh, to Varun, uh, Varun, who is actually from India, um, also studying in in Barcelona, and he has uh, some uh, bigger questions on that creativity and and how to use it. Cool. Hello, Johnny. Hey there, Varun. My name is Varun. I'm from India. I've been studying tourism and hospitality, uh, somewhat close to your field. But due to the COVID, I had to uh, figure out ways in which I could upscale myself. So I got a camera, same Sony A7, nice. but uh, there's this point where you start experimenting with creativity and exploring how you can use it within your work. And with journalism, I think it includes a lot of facts. I think it's really hard. Was it, uh, in your opinion, what are the key factors that allowed you to become an Emmy-nominated journalist? The, there are two, I would say two major factors that led to a, tr a transformation. The first one was a refinement of the technical craft. Basically, if I want to share this idea, what's the best visual to do it? And that's when I started to hack mapping. I'm not a cartographer. I don't have any sort of technical cartography experience, but I started to download these high-res maps and take so many tutorials on how to zoom into this one country so I can show it because I know that if I can show it, then the viewer can understand it. And so refining the technical craft based on the need to communicate, what are you trying to communicate and what technical craft do you need to communicate is, is number one. But there's a whole other craft with this, which is the craft of journalism, which is how do you in a concise way share real facts and real proof to convince somebody and make them feel understanding. And that that came through none, none of my own efforts. That came from an editor, a, a story editor at Vox named Joss, Joss Fong, who would look at my scripts. And I mean, if you could, if you could see my scripts in 2015 or 2016, how thin they were on facts, how indulgent they were in writing, how non-visual they were in the writing, it, you would you would just see a very sad sight. I, I was not a good writer from a, from a journalistic standpoint. I had a lot to learn. And Joss as an editor would just patiently and very almost harshly explain the, the right way to do it. And, and there's something really powerful about having a mentor like that who can look at your scripts and guide you. And that I would say that's the other huge ingredient is the craft of journalism that came from edit, not just Joss, but and others uh, that I don't have anymore. And I actually, it's an issue. I, I need, I don't have that, that feedback of somebody looking at my script and saying, don't, don't write this whole section. This is way too bloated. Make that one line. Um, but having that oversight is really important. But the thing that is in your control is that craft, learn the tools, learn them so well that if you want, if you have an idea you can visualize it because you're yeah. fluent in the tools. Uh, I also had another question. Uh, through your journey from going from somebody who was interested in international relations all the way to becoming a journalist, what is your biggest takeout uh, from yourself? You know, what would, 
What's your biggest take out? My, the, I would say that the transition from an academic frame to a communi- like a mass communication frame uh, is that there is a, a, a silo, there is a wall between those two that, that and like I, this is what I was saying earlier to, to Vicky about, about so much good work being done in academia. I would sit through these lectures and be like, oh, I understand this theory of hegemonic stability or, you know, these theories we're talking about. But it's like no one in the world will ever understand this. And, they, and it's not like it's super hard cognitively to understand. It just needs to be said in the right words. And so finding ways to take an academic paper or a political science talk and that's an hour long from a, a professor that sort of just talks and talks and talks about technical theories and, and to distill that into a way that anyone can understand it. Anyone can understand it. That is an exercise that you can start at any point. You can read those things and then you can decide, how do I try to communicate? And then you test it out. You test it out on your friends. You test it out on your family. I'm going to explain this thing and see if they understand. And if they don't understand, ask them what they're not understanding. Log that in and, and refine that in the future. That's what effectively I do all the time. That's what my YouTube subscribers are. They're my friends and family. I'm sharing. If it doesn't resonate with them, I take that and I, and I improve my script next time. So that communication, breaking that, those silos between academic ideas and good journalism and communication is to me, again, the undervalued or the, the thing that will be valued. It's more and more valued. I've made a career out of that value that's growing, but it's not valued in institutions. Schools don't teach this. And uh, so you sort of have to teach yourself, which is probably the better way to do it anyway. Yeah. And, you know, th- there's a couple of other questions that, that are coming through the chat, Johnny, that, that are quite related to that, actually. I mean, at, at the end of, of your explanation now, you talked about the, um, you know, the difference about, you know, as an individual, you can sort of learn these skills and value these skills of mass communication, whereas an institution, you find it, that it, often that's not really uh, the case to the same degree. Um, so, one of the questions we got was precisely about that, uh, about that sort of uh, attention that as an individual, you can be very creative and, and you can find what works best in an institution. It's, it's, uh, it's a little bit harder. What, you know, is, is that just how it is that you, as an individual, you can learn those skills in an institution that's just not possible because it's an institution or, or is there a good way to do it? An institution, institutions are really good at gathering the best information over time and, 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 conveying it in their own vernacular to people who are ready to hear it in that environment. So, so basically I'm, I call this soft skills. Uh, you know, in grad school, we sit around and talk about these theoretical frameworks all day. And I, that's amazing stuff. Like that's what institutions are good at. They're good at giving you the teaching you how to think about the world, but the skill of, of then going and communicating that on the ground in an authentic way, in the way that people are learning today I don't think we can ever expect an institution to be in touch with the real time, how things actually play out on TikTok. Like I'm, I started a TikTok uh, last week and I would never expect a, 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 even a journalism school to be in touch with that. Right. Institutions are good at long-term soft skill knowledge generation. And, I val- and I'm very grateful that I, I benefited from that. The hardcore stuff is mu- the, the hard skills. The craft is much more better developed in the trenches uh, or in, in the, the reality of back and forth real time social media creation and, and without the sort of gatekeeper mentality of peer review, which has its has its place. They're two totally separate genres of learning. And I really believe that the hard skills should not be acquired in an institution. They should be acquired in the rogue, real West, the wild west and the soft skills, how to think about the world. The, the knowledge that we've acquired as human beings over time is, is best placed in, in, a, in a college. I could be wrong on that. I'm sure there are really good programs that are doing more on the ground tactical stuff in an effective way, but I, I don't want to put the expectations on an institution to be in touch with real time, how things are communicated today, right. especially in a social media context. And, you know, that, of course, you know, you're, you're basically saying, or at least I'll, I'll choose to interpret this way, is that, you know, it, it really is a good idea to, to travel, to go out there in the fields and to, to gain a lot of these skills, experience uh, and all of that. Natalia, one of the students that is, that's, that's joined us too, um, she's asking a question about that. How do you do that best? How do, what do you recommend to young travelers 
uh, how to get the best experience uh, from all the places that that they're visiting. I mean, you've got a lot of experience with that. By the way, she loves your yeah. video blog, she says. <laughs> oh, great. Thank you. Um, so it depends what your goal is. If your goal is to learn how to communicate, um, don't wait for somebody to give you an assignment to go make a video. Go make a video. Go make a video or go make a video or a, a photo essay or go... Uh, create a data visualization based on your, your travel. Um, do that on your own, acquire those skills on YouTube. It's, it's all accessible. And if you want to learn the experience of going to a place and telling a story about your trip, nothing is stopping you other than the, putting in the time to, to develop those skills. And it's not going to be what you want it to be. The first time you start making stuff, it's going to be way far away from what it's like me. I'm learning piano right now. And I'm nowhere near where I want to be, but it's like, I got to start, I got to keep plugging away at it. Everyone has to start somewhere. If you're not interested in communication or you're not going to travel to, to tell stories about it and you just want to immerse yourself and in, in enlighten yourself, I would say that the best way to do that is to find a way to go to a place that doesn't have a, what I call a tourist machine. A lot of these economies build up around serving a customer. It's a business. And I, in fact, uh, Peter, you're, <laughs> I think you went to school in Leuven, right? That's right. Uh, yep. So I was speaking at a conference in Leuven outside of Brussels and maybe there's some tourism there, but it didn't seem like there was a tourist machine. That's I showed right. up That's place right. And I felt like I, I, you know, in Brussels, you're fed through the tourist machine. You go onto the Grand Place and now go over here to this gift shop and now get Godiva chocolate and now do this. When you go to Leuven, which I would have never gone to, I felt like I was in Belgium, real Belgium. And I, and I learned so much more about Belgium there than I, than I've ever learned. I lived in Brussels for, you know, for a while. I love Brussels. It's a fantastic place. If you want to go and interact with a mind enlightening experience, go to a place. It's sort of a cliche that off the beaten path, but, but like go to a place where there is no incentivized tourist infrastructure to feed you a certain experience that's meant for the least common denominator where you have to interact with how people actually do things. Um, so that's, that's my, that's my sort of travel advice for someone. Who's yeah. And the, obviously thanks for the shout out to uh, my, not only the city where I, I studied, but also where I was born in Leuven. Um, mm. You know, another country that you have quite a, a bit of uh, experience with uh, is Colombia. Mm -hmm. um, and actually there's also a student from Colombia, Sophie, uh, who now lives in Switzerland, but is from Colombia. And, and she says, I mean, she, she, she loves what you do uh, or what you've done about Colombia. She says it brings a better image to my country because, um, you know, because you do things that are different. You don't necessarily talk about the, uh, the drug story or, or the, 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 the typical, the stereotypical image that you would get from a particular country. Um, she's asking you, you know, what, um, what would, if you would go back, what would you investigate next about Colombia? And, and why do you think it's been so attractive to be um, to be doing things around that, not just for you, but obviously it's, it's gotten into popular culture also with these series lately, et cetera. Yeah. So I think if I went back, I would, I'm really interested in, in, I'm really interested in taking topics that are covered a lot, but then finding the sort of like thing that no one's looking at part of it. The, the, the migrant crisis, you know, unprecedented numbers of Venezuelans flooding in, everyone's covered that. And, and the angle I wanted to take on that was the historical ties between these two countries, because a lot of Colombians fled into Venezuela and there's a sort of brotherhood that exists between the two. And that was sort of the angle, the drug story, instead of talking about cartels, talking about the farmers who are in the middle of all of that, who have no interest in drugs, they're just trying to survive. And that's the only economy because there's no government infrastructure. If I were to go back, I would probably do the same thing. Find a, a well-covered topic like coffee and coffee and, and climate change. That's been covered a million times. I would want to go find what's the juicy human angle that, that no one's talking about that helps illuminate this. Because my, my big theory of media is that once we see the same take three or four times, we numb out. It almost cancels it almost cancels out the reality of it once we see it three or four times. It becomes a spectacle. Yeah, fixed idea a, and that's it. Yeah, and that's it. And then and then people are parroting each other using the same words and it becomes this weird like, oh, this is now a bubble. It's, it's not a real thing. It's like a bubble of abstract information. Going and breaking that bubble and saying, no, look at this other version. And video is an amazing way to do this because you can actually point a camera at it and say like, this is what it looks like. 
that that is what I try to do in every place. Look at it in a way because I, I look at it in a way that I would want to see it, not the bubble of abstract information, but like, how do I actually relate to these these people? So I don't know what that would be. It, it takes a lot of digging to find what that is, but uh, probably coffee or something like that that's well known, but not that has other angles that are not well understood. Yeah, and, and you do that for really, a, I think, a global audience, because we've heard, of course, from uh, many students today, but also we see in the chat, uh, I see another comment from Yerasil, uh, who is from Russia and who commends you on the, the video you did about uh, Alexei Navalny. He says, I don't think that the, the government would necessarily like what you did there, nope. um, but, uh, but, he, but he sure does appreciate it. Um, you know, maybe to, 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 to finish it off, you know, like we, we are getting a lot of questions, though, about, you know, you're now an established, you know, sort of filmmaker on YouTube, which is really not, you know, easy. And it certainly is something that a lot of people aspire to. Um, you know, do you have any sort of final advice if you want to be successful, if you want to start your own YouTube channel, um, you know, how to go about that? And, and perhaps also uh, for those that are interested in your philosophy that, that you have behind it, which is to sort of bring, let's say, more or less intellectual topics, but then, uh, uh, you know, go about them in a way that, that many people would understand. Any final advice for, for the students? First off, and I've said this is something that I've said maybe five times in this, in this uh, chat, but um, you have to refine a craft that there is craftsmanship or in this. And, and that is, there's no secret formula other than in the same way that I'm practicing piano every morning, you have to practice communicating. You have to practice communicating. And like I said, it's not going to sound good at first. Uh, if you were to hear my piano playing now, you'd be like, this is not, like, I don't want to listen to this. That's how your videos or your data viz or whatever is going to be at first. You're not going to want to show anyone. You're going to be like discouraged. And, and that, that the gravity is pulling you back towards just giving up because it's, it's not what you want. Only through repetitions do you develop a, a, a craft that you're proud of and that, that actually starts to become something that you can share and then eventually monetize. But that's a long, that's a long journey. Um, but there's certainly not a lack of resources on how to do that. You could learn everything that I know on YouTube and that's where I learned it. You know, I learned it from YouTube and, and Skillshare and, and just sort of messing around. That, and that just takes time. So start developing a craft. And if, it, and if it's a craft, don't let that craft be what I tell you. Let that craft be something that you're naturally interested in because that's going to be the fuel that gets you through the hard times of discouragement. You should be nat If you're naturally interested in graphic design, lean into that and, and keep going in that direction. Um, in terms of the actual sharing, what types of information you share, for, and this is my experience. If you talk to 10 different YouTubers, you'll probably get different uh, you'll get different answers, but mine has come from a very natural curiosity of what do I, what do I want to know about the world that isn't shared anywhere? I can go search it a million times, but it doesn't exist. I'm going to make that. I'm going to go fill a void. That's what Bright Trip is. Bright Trip is, I wish, you know, as a dyslexic person, I hate travel books. They're, they're so hard for me because it's just, it's so much information. I want a video. I want a video based course that teaches me about a place and so we built Bright Trip. That that is that is what I've always done. I want to understand what's really going on with the coca trade in Colombia, and no one's everyone's just talking about cartels. I'm going to go fill that void. Let your curiosity guide because you're going to make your best work if you have natural curiosity. Um, at Bright Trip, we're doing this thing called Bright Bites, which are two to five minute micro explainers about a place. Anyone can do it. You don't, you just need a phone, but it's basically a way for people to, and then eventually we're going to create a big library of everyone's experience of, of uh, explaining how to eat uh, crepes in Paris or how to order or how to get a bus ticket in Morocco or whatever it is. It's a way, I believe, a way to train a large group of people to do the repetitions of explaining little micro bits of information in a very, very low production format to practice because that's what it takes. It takes practicing, sharing little bits of information over and over and over again. And after a hundred, you're a lot better than the first. So, so yeah, that's a lot there, but let your curiosity guide and know that this is a craft. It is like woodworking or cooking. You have to practice and you have to sort of do it a bunch. And, and I've been in the trenches for eight years practicing and, and that's where, where all of this comes from. It didn't come from just some special talent that I had. It came from a lot of practice.
Yeah, and I think that's, I mean, amazing advice uh, for all of us to follow. Um, and, and we have that opportunity, don't we? I mean, like we, we can, of course, learn from sessions like this. But as you said, we can go out and, and explore uh, on YouTube and other channels uh, more about that. Uh, Johnny, I mean, it's been amazing to spend this hour with you. I, you know, I, I'm sure everybody here will agree. I see so many smiling faces and uh, all this, also the students sort of uh, uh, nodding in agreement. So thank you so much for spending your time with us, even as your nanny's not there <laughs> and, uh, you know, you only have a limited amount of time. We learned so much. Uh, thank you for, for doing this. And uh, we hope to see you soon in person, uh, perhaps yes. in Switzerland or Barcelona or somewhere else. In the I, world. That sounds amazing. It was great being here. Thank you, everyone, for your awesome questions. I'll, uh, I'll see you soon. All right. Thank you so much. And I'll leave it off to Luke to uh, send us off into the, into the night. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you very much, Johnny. Well, first of all, uh, another congratulations to reaching your milestone of this one million. Let's hope for the for the next millions to come fast. Good luck as well in 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 the venture of of, of Bright Trip and and lot of success with that. Hopefully, the years to come will even be brighter than uh, uh, facing the pandemic. Um, amazing experience for our students. Uh, the natural uh, curiosity is definitely a point that everybody needs to get, get out from, from this session, I think, and, and become more creative. Um, next for us is already next week, where we will have the guru of artificial intelligence, Mr. Tom Siebel, which is the, the founder of C3 AI, and he will tell us all about the artificial intelligence. So. I hope that everybody will be connecting next week, uh, Thursday, uh, 5 p.m. In the meantime, stay safe, uh, study art, and I'll see you soon. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye.